Hello everyone, my name is Alison Robertson and I'm an Extension Plant Pathologist with Iowa State University Extension and Outreach and I'm very happy to be here today to talk about fungicides, back to the basics. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about fungicides and the various ways that they can be classified. Um, and then we're going to look at our, um, my multi-location corn fungicide trials just very briefly at the end of this, uh, after we've talked about fungicides. So first of all, what is a fungicide? A fungicide is a chemical compound, or it can also be a biological organism that is used to kill a parasitic fungi and their, and their spores. And a fungicide normally has a product name, just like every pesticide that you use has a product name or a trade name. For example, Roundup would be the product name or the trade name of a herbicide. Headline would be the product name or a trade name of a fungicide. And then each of those products contains an active ingredient, which is the chemically active component of that formulated product. And that active ingredient name normally dub doubles as the common name of that product. So for example, with Roundup, the active ingredient is glyphosate. That's also the common name of the product, glyphosate. Headline, the active ingredient is paraclostrobin, which is also the common name of the product. And the reason why we have this common name is because these pesticides can be, can be sold under different names. And so that's why it's important to know the common name of the product that you're using. So what diseases are, are controlled by fungicides? Obviously those diseases that are caused by fungi. And so here in Iowa, the most important diseases that we would be thinking about for spraying a fungicide would be tar spot, northern corn leaf blight, gray leaf spot and southern rust, which all occur on corn. And then on soybeans, we'd be using fungicides to manage frog eye leaf spot and also white mold. Why do we use fungicides in Iowa? To manage disease and protect yield. And what types of fungicides do we use on corn and soybean in Iowa? And so I'm sure most of you have heard us talk about strobes or strobilurins, triazoles, and then also the SDHIs. Strobes, strobilurins, and triazoles are actually nicknames. The proper names for these group of fungicides are the QOIs or the group 11 fungicides, the DMIs or the group 3 fungicides, and the SDHIs, which belong to group 7. And those group names and numbers are specifically the FRAC group names and numbers. So FRAC is the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee. And this is an international committee that classifies fungicides into FRAC code groups based on how the fungicide kills the fungus. So based on the, the fungicide's mode of action. There are several modes of action that a fungicide can have can stop respiration, it can prevent cell membranes from forming, it can stop transcription of the DNA, prevent cell division, and several other methods. So we're going to be talking mainly about the group 11, 7, and 3 fungicides, which are those fungicides that we use predominantly here in Iowa. And so this is a table that we're going to be going through. And so you can see the group name up there, the QOI fungicides, which would be your strobilurins or your, your strobes, the SDHIs and the DMIs, which would be your triazoles. Okay, you can see the FRAC group code there. And then you can see that the QOI fungicides and the SDHI fungicides both inhibit respiration while the DMI fungicides are active against membrane sterile biosynthesis. So what do I mean by this? So remember, respiration occurs in the mitochondria, in the cells. And basically what happens is there's aerobic respiration going on, and the product of aerobic respiration is energy. This process takes part on, on the inner mitochondrial membrane, which looks like this, and in, in that membrane, which is those that, that yellow bile, bilipid layer, um, you can see these five proteins that are inserted into the membrane. 
And the, along those membranes, we get this flow of electrons, which results in the production of ATP or energy. So for the SDHIs and the QOIs inactivate a critical enzyme or protein in this key metabolic process. And this is shown here. So the SDHIs affect complex two in the electron transport train, whereas the QOIs are working at a on a different protein, different enzyme in that electron transport train, which is the um, QO site in co the complex three protein. The DMIs affect sterile biosynthesis in membranes. So this here is a, a, a picture showing you a fungal cell wall. And so you can see on the outside the, the, the blue blobs and the green blobs um, and the pinkish blobs. Those are all part of the fungal cell wall. And then below that is this fungal cell membrane. So once again, that phospholipid bilayer. And you can see that within that phospholipid bilayer, we have these um, ergosterols that are in the membrane. And what the triazoles do is they prevent the formation of those sterols. And so if we don't have those sterols, the fungal cell membrane can't, can't form. And if the fungal cell membrane can't form, then the cell wall can't form. And that means that the fungus is not able to grow. So back to this table again, we now see that the QOI, their targets, although like the SDHIs, they affect respiration, they have a different target site. Um, complex three um, at the QOI sites, they affect cytochrome, cytochrome BC1, whereas in, uh, um, with the SDHIs, they're affecting this enzyme um, succinate dehydrogenase. And then with the DMI fungicides, um, they are affecting the enzyme C14 demethylase, and so, they are, so these fungicides prevent those fungi from forming membranes. So we're going to take a break from that table, and we're going to now talk about infection in a leaf. And we're going to relate those fungicides to, to how a fungus infects a leaf. So first of all, here's a, a diagram which just shows generally what happens with fungal infection. A spore lands on the surface of a leaf, it um, germinates, so we have a little germ tube that's produced, and then a, what's called an aprosorium, and then from that aprosorium, the fungus produces a penetration peg that penetrates in through the epidermis of the cell into the, into the mesophyll cells, where the, the fungus then starts to grow those mycelium and colonize those mesophyll cells. Eventually, the fungus will produce a fruiting structure, and from that fruiting structure, we will get sporulation. Now, depending on the pathogen and on the and the environment, this cycle, this disease cycle, can take five to more than fourteen days. So, for something like southern rust, when it's um, when there's a lot of leaf moisture, when it's um, when the temperatures are in the high eighties, we can get a spore landing on a leaf, germinating, and producing more spores within five days. Whereas for something like grey leaf spot under optimum conditions, that disease cycle can take 14 days. So if we're thinking about QOIs and SDHIs, they prevent energy production, right? This means that the spores can't germinate because the spores are not able to produce any energy, and so we don't get that germ tube forming. With the DMIs, the DMIs prevent fungal cell membrane formation, and so the hyphae can't grow. So the one thing about that, um, this picture here on the right shows, okay, is if we look at it um, in figure A, we have no um, triazole in that mix, no propoconazole. And then B, C, and D, the amount of propoconazole increases. And what I hope you can see is that the number of hyphae that are growing are getting less and less and less as the propoconazole concentration increases. If you look at D, you can still see very tiny little hyphae being produced. And those hyphae that you can see are actually the germ tubes. So the spores of a fungus contain enough sterile to at least allow that fungus to germinate. But once it's germinated and then comes into contact with the, with the triazole, 
it no, can no longer form the membranes, and so that's how it. Um, and so then the, the fungus fungicide kills the the fungus. So how do fungicides reduce disease severity? Um, this is a, a great um, picture from the University of Flor Florida, but it shows that disease cycle again at the top. And then you can see the strobilurin and the triazoles there. So you can see the strobilurin in the orange is preventing the germination of the, of the spores, right? Whereas the triazoles is preventing that um, infection and that early mycelial growth into the, into the, the, the mesophyll of the, of the leaf. So I think that this illustrates if you think about the picture that we just looked at, showing the spores germinating with those tiny germ tubes, we can still get germination of the spores, but they're just then unable to colonize the leaf. So because of these properties, we then, um, that led to some marketing information about preventative versus curative activity. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time on that because um, I don't really like preventative and curative terms, and I want to explain to you why I don't like those. So once again, back to that disease cycle, okay? Remember the QOIs and the SDHIs are preventing respiration, which means there's no energy production allowed in that spore, which means they cannot germinate, okay? So they prevent infection. If we look at the DMIs, there's enough that, which are preventing that sterile formation, that membrane form formation of that fungus, there's enough sterile in the spore to allow the spore to start to produce that germ tube, but then comes into contact with that triazole and that inhibits early fungal development. So I just remind you here, that's basically what we showed on the slide before. And so this led to the idea that the QOI and the SDHIs had preventative activity because they prevent the spore from germinating but the DMIs have curative activity. So I'm going to illustrate the curative and preventative properties of um, a fungicide using some research that Darren Mueller actually did during his um, postdoc. And what he did was he looked at the activity of contact, QOI, and DMI fungicides against rust on sunflowers. And he applied these fungicides 15, 10, 5, and 1 days before inoculation, one hour before inoculation, one hour after inoculation, and then one, three, five, and seven days after inoculation. And he counted the number of rust pustules that occurred on the sunflowers. So this is what the chart's going to look like. You can see on the vertical axis, we have the number of rust lesions on the sunflower. And then at the bottom, Along the x-axis, we have the days when those plants were inoculated, okay? Days before, days after, and then remember that one hour before, one hour after. Okay, so I think you can agree that if a fungicide was sprayed before the plants were inoculated and it protects against disease, then it would have preventative ac activity. If we spray the fungicide after we've inoculated the plant, and it prevents disease, then it would have curative activities. So first of all, this is with the, a contact fungicide, which we don't widely use on corn and soybeans anymore. These would be the older fungicides like Bravo um, or chlorothalonol. But um, so what you can see here is that with a contact fungicide, we significantly decreased the amount of rust disease compared to the no no fungicide applied control, okay? If there's a star above the bar, that means it was significant. So um, the, now we can see this nice reduction in disease. But if we applied that fungicide one day or more after we'd inoculated, that fungicide had no effect on that infection. So the orange bars now here show the DMI fungicide. And what you can see is that even at 15 days before inoculation, that DMI still significantly reduced the amount of disease. And it reduced the amount of disease throughout the experiment. And so that shows us that a DMI has preventative and curative properties. 
Lastly, if we look at the QOIs, um, which is kind of hard to see because QOIs are excellent against rust on sunflowers, but if you just look at the stars there, you can see that similarly, the QOI prevented that rust developing on those sunflowers even after inoculation, showing that a QOI can also have um, curative properties. So this is one of the reasons why I just really don't like the use of preventative and curative for the, the QOIs or the strobies and the DMIs or the triazoles, because really both QOI and DMI fungicides have preventative and curative properties. Okay, I'm quickly gonna take you back to this complicated table, but um, basically what I wanted to show you here is that within each of these groups, there are other groups, right? So within FRAC code group 11, there are um, two or more chemical or biological groups. Once again, these, um, these groups have a group name, but they, so they have a group name. And then we can see within those groups, we also have um, various fungicides. So azoxystrobin um, would fall into the methoxy acryolite, Paraclostrobin is a methoxycarbamate, but they are both QOI fungicides. And so there's just some, um, some difference. There's some groups within these larger groups that we talk about that I think it's good to know about. And then the other thing that I wanted to point out is resistance. And so the QOI and the SDHI Fungicides both have a very high risk of resistance developing, whereas with the DMI fungicides, there's a slightly lower risk um, medium, but still a risk that it, um, resistance will develop. So when I'm talking about resistance, um, how does resistance develop? Basically, repeatedly using fungicides with the same mode of action, so the same frac code can lead to fungicide resistance. And so we have this fungicide classification chart, um, which is available from USB. But what you can see here is the different fungicides that are available for use on um, field crops. And you can see that we have seven frac groups. Compare this to the herbicide classification, where there are 17 site of action, which would be equivalent to our mode of action groups in, fun in fungicides. How does fungicide resistance develop? So fungicides act as a selection pressure and they select the resistant isolates. So repeatedly using the same group, same frac group, and those frac groups are numbers that you'll see on your fungicide labels, re repeatedly using those same numbers is gonna lead to resistance. The QOI resistance or strobe resistance um, is basically dominated by three single step mutations have been associated with resistance. So that's just, the fungus just had to change one step in a metabolic process to overcome that fungicide. The most common mutation is G143A, and this is very, very common. Um, that's what we find the most, and it has no effect on pathogen fitness. What do I mean by that? It means that once the, the fungus mutates to overcome that fungicide, um, it can survive just as well as the wild type or the, the, the non-mutant fungus, if you like. Um, it'll produce as many spores, um, it'll infect as quickly, so there's no effect on the pathogen whatsoever. Whereas with the, um, other, the other mutations that occur are less um, common and only give partial resistance. So I should go back to that 143A and just point out that it's either, the fungus is either resistant or not resistant. It's very yes, no, um, very definite. With DMI resistant or the triazoles resistance, resistance is usually a multi-step process that um, is a combination of one or more of these mutations. And the thing with DMI resistance is that the fungicide efficacy slowly erodes over time as the fungal population becomes less and less sensitive. And so we are working with colleagues in um, Kentucky to monitor DMI resistance in, the, in corn leaf spot pathogens and then also um, uh, soybean pathogens 
just to keep an eye on, on how, these, how these populations are evolving every year and, how, and if they're becoming less sensitive to the DMIs. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on fungicide resistance, but just a note um, to follow the rules to prevent fungicide resistance. And so that means rotating or mixing fungicides from different groups. Um, a lot of the fungicides that we use on, on corn and soybeans are a premix of um, a 3 and 11 or a 7 and 11 or a 3, 7 and 11. So that's helpful. Um, always use labeled rates and spray at times. Um, which are critical for disease control. Limit the number of applications of any fungicide group in a growing season. Educate yourself about fungicide groups and resistance management. And S is select fungicides that have multiple sites of activity, um, which we do not have the um, option to do that on corn and soybeans in Iowa. Right, so um, we've talked about how fungicides can be classified ac according to their frac group, but they can also be classified on their, based on their mobility in the plant. So if we look at a fungicide, it can be classified either as a contact fungicide or as a systemic fungicide. Now, systemic can be a little bit misleading because fungicides are not systemic like herbicides. And so I noticed that um, Damon Smith at Wisconsin has used the terms non-penetrating and penetrating. Um, so with the systemic or the penetrating fungicide, fungicides, they can be acropetal, which means they're absorbed into the xylem and they move towards the leaf tips. They can be ambimobile, which means they can move up and down the plant. Or they can be locally systemic, which means that the fungicide will accumulate in the waxy cuticle and it might move through the leaf to the um, other, um, other side of the leaf on the, on the cuticle. But really, fungicides do not, do not move um, a lot. Um, so if we look at a contact fungicide, um, not absorbed into the leaf tissue. So you can see the orange fungicide just sitting on the top of the, of the, of the leaf tissue. And these would be the older fungicides. Um, but with the newer fungicides, most of those newer fungicides have some systemic activity or they're able to penetrate the leaf tissue. This would be a locally systemic fungicide. So you can see that that fungicide has been absorbed into the cuticle. And then you can see that there's some translaminum movement, it's moving across the leaf and uh, accumulating in that lower leaf, lower, that cuticle along the lower epidermis. Um, acropetal would mean that the fungicide is absorbed into the xylem and then moves towards the leaf tips. So here you can see that fungicide applied to the um, leaf surface um, has been absorbed into the, the mesophyll cells and then into the xylem cells. And from there, you'll remember that the xylem moves water, and so water only moves one way in a plant, right? Up and out. With the ambimobile, this would be the, where the fungicide is. It's similar to the, the previous example, except the fungicide is now absorbed into the phloem, and the phloem can move, um, can move substances up and down the plant, and so a fungicide with that activity would be able to move up the plant as well as down the plant. So if we look at our fungicides, our different fungicides, the DMII, most of those are acropetal, which means they're absorbed into the xylem and move short distances to the edge of the leaf, similar for the SDHIs. And then for the QOIs, there's a big variation in just how systemic those, those strobilurins are, but they can be acropetal. They can also be locally systemic, meaning that they just get absorbed into that cuticle and then may move across the leaf to the other cuticle. So I wanted to illustrate the movement of these fungicides using a couple of um, studies that have been published. And so this is the movement of a QOI or a strobilurin in wheat to reduce powdery mildew. So what you can see here is the leaf at the top is, um, has, powder, has been inoculated with powdery mildew and has disease all the way through the leaf. That would be our untreated control. Then the four leaves below, you can see where, what area was treated with the fungicide 
before inoculation. Okay, so the fungicide was only put on that quarter of the leaf. Okay, if you look at trifloxystrobin and methyl, which are the bottom two leaves, you can see that that area was protected and there was a little bit of area on either side of, of that area which also had protected and that's probably due to some vaporization of this, this fungicide that just moved outside, of, moved outside of that area and protected that leaf. And then if you look at percoxystrobin and azoxystrobin, those um, leaves two and three, you can see that the leaf has been protected all the way to the tip, right? But, the, but the, the area below has not been protected. And that's because those fungicides are absorbed into the xylem and then the xylem will move up and to the outer edges of the leaf. Um, this is another example showing, so a movement of an SDHI in cucumber also to reduce powdery mildew. So you'll remember that the SDHIs um, are like the DMIs and they um, are um, move through the xylem. So what in this experiment, what he did was um, sprayed half of a leaf. So you can see the leaf that was sprayed um, covered um, with those yellow dots. That indicates the fungicide. Then um, the underside of the leaf was sprayed with a fungicide. So that's the underside. Um, the top leaf was sprayed with the fungicide. So now what we're looking now is to see can the fungicide move down the plant? Okay. And then we also have the fungicide sprayed on a lower leaf. So now we're looking to see if the fungicide can move up the leaf. And then what happened was each of the, the, those leaves that are, are um, highlighted now with that dash circle, those are the leaves which were assessed for powdery mildew disease. And these are the results. So what you can see is that when um, half the leaf was sprayed or the underside of the leaf was sprayed with this SDHI, that was, there was very good disease control. Okay, but when the, when the bottom leaf was sprayed, there was a little bit of disease control, but probably not a lot to get excited about. And when the top leaf was sprayed, there was absolutely no control of the powdery mildew. So application to the leaf protected that leaf against disease and only that leaf. Leaves that did not receive the fungicide were less, very much less, or not protected at all. And this is for an SDHI fungicide, but you would expect to see similar movement for a DMI fungicide. So when we go back to this table, um, this illustrates that the DMI and the SDHI have this acropetal movement, whereas the, the QOIs can either be acropetal or they can be locally systemic. And just a note there that when a fungicide is, is systemic, it is not systemic like a herbicide would be. As you might expect, there's always an exception to the rule. And so here's an exception here with flutriophol. So flutriophol is the active ingredient in the fungicide Zyway. Zyway is a new fungicide that you may have heard of that gets applied in furrow at planting. And um, data from Kentucky and Tennessee suggests that it has very good season long control against northern corn leaf bite and gray leaf spot. So Marty Chilvers at Michigan State University this past um, yeah, actually went out at um, R3, collected leaves from fungicides that had been treated with flutriophol um, at planting, and he was able to detect the fungicide in every single leaf throughout that plant. Okay, so let's talk about fungicides and disease development. So here we have tar spot just developing on a leaf. If you came back, to that same plant a week or two weeks later, you would expect to see more disease. And if you came back another week later, you would expect to see even more tar spots. And another week later, you would expect that leaf to have died and just be covered in tar spot. And so basically what's happening here is we just have these disease cycles going on, right? Okay. So. We call tar spot, angry leaf spot, northern corn leaf blight, 
most of these diseases that we work with, we call them polycyclic diseases because there are many infection cycles in one growing season. So when we use a fungicide to effectively manage a foliar disease, um, this, this graph here shows what would happen if there was no fungicide, right? It's just illustrating the slide that we just looked at where we have this exponential increase in disease. So um, that vertical axis could be the number of tar spot lesions, that stromata that we counted on that leaf. And so it'll increase exponentially, right? So we have these different disease cycles. So what happens if we come in and spray a fungicide at VT? What does that disease curve do? Does it change? Yes, it changes, right? It shifts to the shifts to the right. And so this shows you with the fungicide. And so what we have is we have, we've sprayed the fungicide, it's preventing infection, okay? And so we have no disease, but then the fungicide runs out, right? These fungicides do not work throughout the, for the whole growing season. Depending on what you can what you apply, that fungicide is gonna um, last for 14 to 35, 42 days. And that um, period where that fungicide is effective, we call the effective period. And that, as I mentioned, that effective period can be 14 to 35 days. It's going to depend on the product that you use. Right, so let's put all of this into perspective, okay? Some farmers are spraying corn at V6. So if we spray corn at V6 with a straightforward fungicide, which would be, you know, the most common fungicides we have are a mixture of DMI and um, QOI. We spray that V6 plant. What leaves are we protecting? Well, every leaf is going to get the fungicide, right? And so every leaf on that plant is going to be protected. Okay, what about at V12? What leaves are going to be protected then? Well, first of all, from the V6 application, those lower leaves, um, you know, th three or four remaining leaves, because remember, um, four or five of those V6 leaves would have fallen off the plant. They're still going to be somewhat protected because it's about 18 days from V6 to V12. And so we should still have some protection there. But when we come in and spray at V12, we should now be re protecting all of those leaves that are, are there on the plant. And when we get to R1, a couple of weeks later, those leaves will be protected. When we spray at R1, we're now going to be spraying the top of the canopy. And it's, it would be unusual for that fungicide to get all the way down to the bottom of the canopy. And the reason for that is because the leaves get in the way. And so we actually have some data on that. This is from some work that I and Josh Sievers at the ISU Northwest Research Farm did um, a few years ago but we put yellow cards out into the canopy, in the upper canopy, on the ear leaf and at the ground. And then we applied um, fungicides in different volumes. And what we were doing was we were trying to monitor how far the fungicide got through the canopy. So these are the data. So first of all, at the ground level, there was a lot of moisture. And so those cards just changed from yellow to blue, although um, in the 20 gallons per acre, you can see a few spots in there, okay? But I hope what you'll notice is in the upper canopy, no matter what the volume is that we used, we had the most spots. And then in the ear leaf, we have less spots. And then down on the ground level, we have very few spots, indicating that not a lot of the fungicide is getting down to, the, to those lower leaves. But really, when we're talking about corn, the most important leaves we want to protect anyway are the ear leaf and above. If we look at the timeline of corn disease development in Iowa, these are diseases that come in okay, during the growing season. So when we apply that fungicide at V6, what diseases are we, um, are we gonna control? Possibly common rust and eye spot, but really remember that a lot of those leaves are gonna fall off the plant anyway and are not gonna contribute to anything to yield. When we spray at V12, um, this is when we could be protecting against um, early gray leaf spot, early northern corn leaf blight. I spot we don't, and common rust we don't usually worry about because they don't get 
um, they're not economically important, but you'll see tar spot there, which um, a V12 application could help with tar spot um, if the disease came in early enough. With that R1 application, now we're controlling for gray leaf spot, tar spot, northern corn leaf blight, and then also southern rust, which in Iowa tends to come in a lot more during the growing season. So let's do the same again with soybean. Some farmers are applying a fungicide at R1, um, possibly for white mold. So once again, we protect that entire canopy. Um, that fungicide will last, but remember we have indeterminate soybeans here in Iowa, so that means they're continually putting on new leaves. So those new leaves would not, would not be protected by that fungicide. So with that R3 application, we then protect those leaves. By the time we get to R6, where we wouldn't apply a fungicide, um, that lower canopy is protected, but the, that upper canopy would not be protected. Once again, if we look at the timeline of soybean disease de development in Iowa, we don't really see any um, diseases developing early in the season for what we would need a fungicide for. But later on during the growing season, um, you know, that R1 application can be helpful with white mold, but really at the end of the day, that R3 application is the best timing to manage not only white mold, but also frog eye leaf spot and Cercospora leaf blight. So in summary, fungicides are chemicals or biological organisms that are used to kill parasitic fungi and their spores. Fungicides can be classified into different groups based on their mode of action, and so those are the FRAC groups. And that is, it's important to know your FRAC groups because of resistant management. Fungicides can also be classified based on their mobility within the plant. So the DMIs and the SDHIs um, are acropetal, which means they get absorbed into the leaf tissue and they move through the xylem so they, can they will protect the leaf onto which they are sprayed, but they will not protect any leaves that are not sprayed. And with the QOIs, um, they can be acropetal, so similar to those DMIs or SDHIs, or just locally systemic, um, protecting that, that leaf that they're sprayed onto. The QOIs and the DMIs both have preventative and curative characteristics. And fungicides break the disease cycle and shift disease development to later on in the growing season. For more information about fungicides, um, you can go to the cropprotectionnetwork.org and there is a web book there called Fungicide Use in Field Crops. And a lot of this information that I presented this morning can be found in this book along with a lot more information. So just quickly, I'm going to talk a little bit about my statewide fungicide trials that occurred in 2021. Um, the same locations that I've used in years past um, with those are the, the hybrids that I used. And you can see that um, all of those stations um, we planted the last week of April. Our VT applica V12 application was around the first week of July. R1 application, the third week of July. And then harvest was October or November. So um, during the 2021 season was very, very dry. These are some um, graphs just showing the precipitation events that occurred at each of the farms. And so we were, we were very dry up until August when we started to get a little bit of moisture. And then we started to see a lot of those um, diseases increase. So at all of my locations, I did, I, by the time I got there, there was no disease at R5. Disease came in later with those August rains. But um, if we look at the yield response from that V12 application, first of all, you can see the, the yields that occurred at each of those farms. Um, so surprisingly good yields, as I'm sure most of you will attest to on your farms. You can see the fungicides that were applied and the rates that were applied. And then um, here are the mean yield responses. So we got very good yield response at Kanawa, the Northern Research Farm, and also up at Sutherland, but not very good yield responses at um, Nashua or the Central Research Farm. Um, and then you can see the, the yield responses for each of those products. And I think what I want 
you to take away from this is that I've highlighted those, the yield responses that were the best at each of the farms. And you can see that for no one product consistently gave the best yield response across all the farms. And so that's kind of frustrating um, when we're trying to understand this yield response to fungicide. Um, if we look at the R1 application, data is laid out a similar way. Now we had positive yield responses at all of those locations. Um, here are the, the, the ranges in the yield response. And once again, consistently no yield response um, or no, no fungicide had a consistent yield response at, at all of those farms. So in summary, we had negligible disease development at R5 because we were extremely dry across the state. Um, yield responses range from negative 13.4 to 19.1 with that B1 application. Um, and the responses were greatest at Kanawa. The yield response to an application at R1 ranged from negative 6 to 23.3 bushels. And um, once again, we had the greatest yield responses at Kanawa and the lowest at here in central Iowa. Thank you for attending this episode of Crops TV. I would be happy to take any questions if you have them. Feel free to email me at alisonr at iastate.edu or you can follow me on Twitter and my Twitter handle is alisonrisu. Thank you.